It's no surprise that your vehicle will drive better if all the wheels are pointed in the same direction. That's called wheel alignment. Now, Paul, what will people notice first if their wheels are out of alignment? Well, usually it's that their vehicle pulls to one side or the other. Now, something that you won't notice right away, but will if you keep driving when you're out of alignment, is that your tires are wearing unevenly and fairly quickly. Well, that's not good. And that's because when the vehicle is pulling to one side, you have to steer it back straight. The outside of the tire just wears out fast because you're constantly turning. Exactly, and that can be very exhausting on a long road trip, fighting to keep the vehicle going straight down the road. Now, some of the things that commonly throw a wheel out of alignment are slamming into a pothole, smacking a curb or something like a rock. And it doesn't have to be a big shock, it can just be the regular bumps and bangs of daily driving that add up and eventually take your vehicle out of alignment. That's why your owner's manual or service advisor may suggest having your alignment checked periodically. So Paul, what do you do to fix the alignment? Well, we measure each wheel's alignment to see where they are relative to factory specifications. And while we have the vehicle on the alignment rack, we inspect the tires for wear, as well as the suspension and steering components for damage or wear, things that can contribute to alignment problems. Now, with some vehicles, you have to adjust all four wheels so they're all brought into alignment. On those vehicles where you can only adjust the front wheels, we bring the front wheels into alignment relative to the rear. Sounds pretty comprehensive. Does it cost a lot? Well, it varies by whether or not it's two or four wheel adjustable. Four wheel drive vehicles may have an additional charge because they're more difficult to align. At any rate, it's cheaper than having to replace tires every few months. Thanks, Paul. So if it's been a while since you've had your wheels aligned, bring your vehicle in for an alignment check. I want to talk today about cabin air filters. There seems to be some confusion about them, and I'm hoping Brittany can help us out. Of course, Dave. I think much of the confusion comes because prior to the 2000 model year, very few vehicles had cabin air filters. So I think people confuse their cabin air filter with the engine air filter. Oh, well, that makes sense. Every vehicle has an engine air filter that cleans the air going into the engine, but not all have a cabin air filter that cleans the air going into the passenger compartment. Easy to get mixed up. Right. The cabin air filter cleans out dust, pollen, spores, and other pollutants. To give a point of comparison, a grain of sand is about 200 microns across. A cabin air filter can stop particles that are just three microns in size. It really makes the passenger cabin a much more pleasant environment. Yeah, I can see that. I've read that the air in your vehicle can be up to six times more polluted than the outside air. So your cabin air filter really has its work cut out for it. Brittany, what do you do when the filter gets dirty? Well, you just need to replace it. Your owner's manual may have a recommended interval for changing it. If not, we can inspect it. You know, it's ironic that many people don't even realize they have a cabin air filter until it starts to get a little smelly. Ugh. Yeah. Is it hard to replace? Well, it depends. Some cabin air filters are very easy to get to. Others, not so much. We have to get behind the dashboard and it takes a little time. Okay. Thanks, Brittany. A clean cabin air filter keeps out smog, allergens, and other harmful pollutants, and it protects your entire heating and air conditioning system from dust and grime. So if it's time, get it changed right away. I'm often asked questions about the cooling system, the system that cools your engine and keeps it at the proper operating temperature. Now I like to divide the topic into two areas. First, the coolant itself, and second, the parts that make up the cooling system. The coolant is the mix of water and antifreeze that circulates through the engine to draw off heat. First, you need to have the proper amount. If you don't have enough coolant, it can't keep your engine cool. You also need the right kind of coolant. Different makes of vehicles require different coolant formulation to protect against corrosion. Finally, your coolant needs to be fresh. Over time and miles, the anti-corrosion additives in the coolant are depleted, and the coolant can actually start to eat away at the cooling system parts. Your owner's manual and your service advisor can help you with the recommended coolant replacement schedule and make sure you're getting the right type of coolant. Now let's talk about the cooling system components. These will all eventually wear out and need to be replaced. Starting with the radiator. We see them coming into the shop with leaks or clogged with deposits. Depending on the damage, we'll clean, repair, or replace. We also see radiator pressure caps that can no longer hold the proper pressure. We recommend replacing pressure caps when you change your coolant to avoid this problem. We see leaky water pumps and hoses that need to be replaced. There's also a part called the thermostat that opens and closes to regulate the flow of coolant. 
Sometimes they stick open or closed and the cooling system won't work properly. It's a straightforward replacement. Now, engine damage from overheating can be very expensive to fix, so it's important to maintain your cooling system properly with scheduled coolant replacement and periodic inspections of the cooling system. Certainly come in if you suspect a leak and have us take a look. When you take a corner in your car, the outside wheels have a slightly longer distance to go than the inside wheels. That means the outside wheels have to turn a bit faster than the inside. And the piece of mechanical wizardry that makes this possible is called the differential. The differential allows the drive wheels to rotate at different speeds in turns without the wheel binding or hopping. If you have a rear wheel drive vehicle, the differential is on the rear axle. You've seen that bulge in the middle of the axle when you're driving behind a truck? That's the differential. If you have a front wheel drive vehicle, the differential function is handled by your transaxle. Of course, all wheel drive vehicles have differentials on both axles. They also have a center differential or a transfer case between the front and rear axles to compensate for speed differences between the front and the rear. Now, because all the power of the engine is transferred through the various differentials, you can imagine that they are very strong and are built to last a long time. That's why it's important to keep your differential properly lubricated. Differential fluid cools and protects the gears. Your service technician will check your differential fluid level and top it off if necessary. With low fluid, the differential will run too hot and wear prematurely. Ask your service advisor for when it's recommended to change your differential fluid. Fresh fluid will extend the life of your differential. Now, of course, differentials eventually wear out and need to be replaced. You might notice a strange noise from your axle area as one of the first warning signs. When the differential shows signs of failing, it's important to repair it. If you leave it too long and it freezes up when you're driving, you could lose control of your vehicle and other parts like the axle, drive shaft, and transmission could be damaged as well. Today we want to talk about your engine air filter. That's the filter that cleans the air before it's burned in your engine. Jeremy, how often should you change your engine air filter? Well, the simple answer is when it's dirty. That's a function of how much air is passed through the filter, so the manufacturer will recommend a mileage interval for replacing the air filter. But you can imagine that how dirty the air is would affect how quickly the filter gets filled. If you drive where there's a lot of dust, pollution, or pollen, your engine air filter will get dirty more quickly and need to be changed sooner. That's why we check the air filter with every full service oil change. We can visually tell if the filter needs to be changed. So, what happens when the air filter gets completely dirty? Well, the filter can only hold so much dirt, so dirt will pass through to the engine once the filter's full. This dirt gums up the combustion chamber and hurts performance and may cause damage. It can also contaminate the mass airflow sensor, which will affect drivability and can be fairly expensive to replace. A dirty air filter would also restrict the amount of air that gets to the engine. That's right, and we can replace your engine air filter with one that matches the factory specifications, or you can upgrade your filter for enhanced performance. Changing a dirty air filter is probably the easiest and least expensive maintenance procedure you can have done, and it really benefits the performance and life of your engine. So when your service advisor shows you a dirty air filter, you'll know how important it is to get it replaced. Michelle and I would like to give you a quick overview of the modern fuel system. It starts with the fuel tank. The fuel pump is located inside the tank and pumps fuel out to the engine. Somewhere along the way is a fuel filter whose job is to filter out dirt before it gets into the engine. Then there's the fuel intake system and the fuel injectors that deliver the fuel to be burned in the engine. Now our focus is to discuss how to make the various components of your fuel system work well and last as long as possible. Now the best thing you can do for your fuel pump is to use good quality fuel. Top tier gas typically has fewer contaminants and more detergents to keep things clean. Using good gas or adding a fuel system cleaner to your tank can prolong the life of your fuel pump. Because the fuel pump lives inside your tank, it's pretty expensive to replace, so helping it last as long as possible is a worthwhile goal. The fuel filter is often called the forgotten filter, but it plays a vital role in how your engine runs. It catches dirt and contaminants. When it's clogged, your engine may not be able to get enough fuel and could sputter. Many fuel filters have a bypass valve that allows unfiltered fuel past when the filter's clogged. That prevents your engine from dying while you're driving, but it can't protect your engine from dirty fuel. 
Check your owner's manual or talk with your service advisor about how often you should replace your fuel filter. Now fuel will cause gum and varnish to build up in the fuel intake system. A professional fuel system cleaning will remove the gunk to keep fuel flowing freely and help prevent contamination from reaching your fuel injectors and your engine. That's right. Fuel injectors spray fuel into the engine. The fuel must be delivered in a precise amount, at a precise time, under precise pressure, and in a precise pattern. Pressure can range from 45 pounds per square inch to 45,000 pounds per square inch, depending on the engine. As you may guess, fuel injectors cost a lot. Allowing them to get gummed up will not only hurt your performance and fuel economy, it will cause the injectors to wear out much more quickly than they should. A professional fuel system cleaning will keep injectors clean and working correctly. It'll also clean deposits from the inside of the combustion chamber and off the intake valves, giving you optimum performance and mileage. Check with your service advisor and see when he recommends you get a fuel system cleaning. Today I'd like to talk about the simple oil change. <laughs> well, the oil change itself may be simple, Dave, but there's some pretty important things to know about preventing oil sludge. Okay, I don't want to disrespect the oil change, <laughs> so tell us more about oil sludge. Well, oil eventually turns into a jelly-like sludge. Now sludge clogs up oil passages and keeps oil from getting to some areas of the engine, causing parts to wear out prematurely, and that means expensive engine repairs. So that's why you need to change your oil and oil filter on schedule to get the old oil out before it turns to sludge. You got it. Your manufacturer should have a recommendation for how many miles you can go between oil changes. They usually have a number of months between recommended oil changes. That's because detergents and other additives in the oil break down over time. Many automakers are extending their oil change intervals. That makes it all the more important to use quality oil and oil filters in your vehicle. So, give us more detail on the recommended oil change intervals. Well, it can be complicated. Your owner's manual will have a recommendation for time and mileage, but you need to remember that it's based on using the recommended weight of oil. And if your vehicle came from the factory with synthetic oil, the recommended intervals assume you continue to use synthetic. What about how you drive? Does that affect your oil change interval? Yeah, how you drive can have a big effect. Many owner's manuals will have a list of driving conditions that are harder on your vehicle. Things like stop and go driving, shorter trips, driving in very hot or very cold weather, heavy loads, and towing. If some of your driving fits this, you may need to change your oil and do other maintenance on a shorter schedule. Okay, now that is starting to sound more complicated. <laughs> it can be. Some vehicles have an oil life calculator that takes all of these factors into account and tells you when you should change your oil. Otherwise, talk to your service advisor about how you drive and get her recommendation for when you take care of your service. And with all of this talk about the oil, let's not forget how important it is to install a quality oil filter when you get your oil changed. Finally, if any of the steering or suspension parts can be lubed, your technician will take care of that with a lube, oil, and filter service. Okay, thanks Brittany. I'll never refer to it as a simple oil change again. We're gonna talk about the power brake system. Basically, the power brake system helps you provide braking power so you don't have to do all the work with your brake pedal. Now, Paul, what's involved in the power brake system? Well, the actual brakes are applied at the wheel using hydraulic pressure. When we step on the brake pedal, we create pressure in the power booster that's multiplied by vacuum from the engine. And the resulting pressure pushes brake fluid through the master cylinder into tubes and hoses that run to the brake at each wheel. So where do the problems with the power brakes usually arise? It's usually a fluid leak somewhere along the line. It could be at a fitting or a hose or even an internal leak in the master cylinder. A leak gives the pressurized fluid somewhere to go other than to the brakes, so stopping power is hurt. Lose enough fluid and you can't stop at all. Well, that's extremely dangerous. So if you notice any decrease in stopping power, or if your pedal seems mushy, you could have a problem. Now, are there any preventive maintenance items for the power brake system? Well, yeah, obviously you'd want to make sure your brake fluid is filled to the recommended level. Master cylinder leaks are usually just because it's worn out. But leaks in the brake lines and connectors can be minimized by replacing the brake fluid from time to time. Brake fluid has additives that protect against corrosion that can damage brake components. Brake fluid also attracts moisture, which can lead to rust. Not a good thing for expensive anti-lock brakes. Also, significant amounts of water in the brake fluid can affect stopping power because the water has a much lower boiling point than the brake fluid. 
In the high temperature environment of the brake system, the water can vaporize, and steam doesn't do a very good job of providing hydraulic pressure. Thanks, Paul. And one final word. Make sure you use the recommended type of brake fluid. There are several kinds, and using the wrong one can lead to total brake failure. Your service advisor can help you. You know that long belt that snakes around the front of your engine? It's called the serpentine belt. The belt's driven by the engine as it turns. It powers your alternator, air conditioning compressor, and power steering pump. On some vehicles, it also runs the water pump, radiator fan, and power brakes. Sounds like a lot of important stuff, doesn't it? Sure does, Michelle. If your serpentine belt were to break, your battery would die in a few miles. If it runs your fan or your water pump, your engine could overheat, and steering and braking could be more difficult. Now, obviously, the best thing is to replace your serpentine belt before it breaks. Your owner's manual recommends regular serpentine belt inspection. Just ask your service advisor. You may have been told to look for cracks in your belt to see if it needs to be replaced. Of course, cracks are still a concern, but modern belt material doesn't crack as often as old belts did. In fact, worn belts often have no visible signs of wear at all. What we look for these days is wear in the grooves where the belt rides over the pulleys. Your technician has a special little tool that measures the depth of the grooves in the belt to see if it needs replacing. A worn belt can slip or be misaligned, putting undue stress on the accessories it runs. Anything else, Jeremy? Yeah, you can imagine it's important for the belt to be tight, so there's a tensioner pulley on your engine that puts pressure on the belt to keep it at the right tension. If the belt is too loose, it'll slip, causing performance problems with the accessories. The spring on the tensioner wears out over time, so we check the tensioner pulley when we replace the serpentine belt. If it's worn, we just replace the tensioner pulley along with the belt. Replacing your serpentine belt and belt tensioner when needed will keep you from an unexpected breakdown. Brittany, it seems like the days when you changed your spark plugs every couple of years have ended. Why is that? Well, they really did wear out that often. A couple of things are different now. First, spark plugs are made of better materials that last longer, and they're designed better. The second reason that plugs used to have to be changed was that they were fouled up with carbon deposits. The deposits built up when fuel wasn't burned completely. That doesn't happen as much now with modern engine controls, right? No, and that's the point. Engine control computers precisely time when fuel is injected into the engine and when spark plugs fire. Unless something's wrong, spark plugs just don't foul like they used to. So walk us through those steps, would you? Sure. Electricity from the battery goes into a coil that allows power to build up to anywhere from 12,000 to 45,000 volts, depending on the vehicle. The engine management computer tells the coil when to release the power to the spark plug. The electricity travels through a wire from the coil to the spark plug. At the tip of the plug, a spark jumps between two electrodes and ignites the gas in the combustion chamber. Some engines have more than one coil. Coils wear out and they need to be replaced occasionally. Also, spark plug wires can wear out and need to be replaced. Now, modern engines are delivering more power and better fuel economy all the time. That's largely credited to fast engine control computers, advanced sensors, electronic ignition, and improvements to the lowly spark plug. <laughs> It'll be interesting to see where the future developments take us. One last thought, Dave. It's critically important to have the right kind of spark plug for your vehicle. Because engines are designed to run with different internal temperatures, spark plugs have different designs to work properly within those temperatures. Your service advisor will be able to get the right plugs for your vehicle. And he'll be able to advise you on when you should replace your spark plugs as well. All right. Thanks, Brittany. You know, I think steering is one of the things we take for granted in our vehicles. So what are some of the things we should know about taking better care of our steering system? Well, I like to think of steering in two areas. First, the power assist. And second, the actual parts that steer the vehicle. Hmm. I bet most people under 40 have never driven a car or truck without power steering. How true. Most vehicles today have a hydraulic power steering pump that provides boost to help you steer. The pump is usually driven by the serpentine belt, but some newer vehicles have an electric pump. Don't some vehicles even have an electric motor that directly powers the steering? You got it. Now the important thing to keep in mind is that these pumps and motors will eventually wear out and the hoses will start to leak. We can postpone that day by having a power steering service from time 
time to time. Your auto center will drain the old fluid and replace it with fresh fluid. This removes water and contaminants that can corrode power steering parts. Ask your service advisor for the recommended change interval. Now, what about the mechanical steering parts? Is there anything you can do to maintain them? Well, if any of the steering parts can be lubed, your technician will take care of that with a lube, oil, and filter service. Other than that, just watch for signs that parts are wearing out. Hmm. Things like loose steering and uneven tire wear, right? Exactly. Worn parts can be replaced to get you back on the road. Now, sometimes parts can be bent or damaged from hitting potholes, curbs, or rocks like I do sometimes. But I think the important thing to remember is to take care of these problems early on. If you neglect them, the damaged parts stress other attached components. Hmm. Kind of starts a chain reaction of damage. Exactly. Steering maintenance is pretty straightforward. Replace power steering fluid as recommended, fix worn or damaged parts right away. That'll save you money in the long run. I want to address a very important maintenance item, timing belt replacement. It's important because letting this one slide can lead to very expensive engine damage. Your timing belt choreographs the timing of your combustion process. Your pistons travel up and down in the cylinder. Intake valves open at the right time to let in air and fuel. They close at the right time to allow the fuel to burn, and then the exhaust valves open at the right time to let out the exhaust. Now, all of this happens thousands of times a minute, and it's your timing belt that makes sure the valves are opening and closing at precisely the right time. If the timing is off, your engine won't run and that's the best case. The worst case is that a valve is opening at the wrong time and collides with the piston. The result is bent valves and maybe even more damage to the cylinder head, and repairs can run several thousand dollars. Now, timing belts just wear out naturally, so you want to replace a worn belt before it slips or breaks. Check your owner's manual or ask your service advisor to see when they recommend you replace the timing belt. If you've never replaced your timing belt and have 60,000 or more miles on the clock, talk with your service advisor right away to see if you're due. On some engines, the water pump is driven by the timing belt as opposed to the serpentine belt. If that's the case, it's a good idea to replace the water pump when you're replacing the timing belt and vice versa since much of the same work has to be done for either. The same is true for the timing belt tensioner. It should be inspected and possibly replaced. Now, replacing a timing belt is one of the more expensive routine maintenance items on your service schedule. But not replacing your timing belt can lead to some of the most expensive repairs you're likely to ever have. We're going to talk about making your tires last longer with regular tire rotation and well balancing. Now let's start with tire rotation, okay Paul? Oh, sure thing. In normal driving, your front tires wear more on the shoulders because they handle much of the cornering forces and turns. Front wheel drive vehicles have even more force on the front tires. We rotate the tires so that all the tires do some duty on the front end as well as getting a little break on the back end. So all four tires were more evenly over their life and last longer. And are tires always rotated front to back? Uh, for most vehicles, yes. Some manufacturers recommend a cross rotational pattern that includes the spare tire. And some high performance vehicles have a different size tire on the front and in the rear and may even have unidirectional tires that can only be on the left or right side of the vehicle. Your service advisor can help you sort that out and will perform the right tire rotation for your vehicle. Your tire manufacturer will have a recommendation for how often you should rotate your tires. It's usually somewhere around five to 8,000 miles. Now let's move on to wheel balancing. That's when there are heavy spots on the tires and wheels that cause a bit of wobble. So balancing adds weight to the wheel to balance it out. But why would a wheel be out of balance in the first place? First of all, we're talking about very small weight differences. Variations in the tire and wheel manufacture can cause a slight imbalance. The valve stem and now the tire pressure monitoring sensors in the tire also play into the equation. Even small differences can cause annoying vibrations at speed. The wheel is essentially bouncing a bit as it goes down the road. For example, at freeway speeds, an out of balance wheel can be slamming into the ground 14 times a second. So not only annoying, but you can also cause your tires to wear out more quickly. That's right. If a front wheel's out of balance, you'll feel the vibration through the steering wheel. When it's a rear tire, you'll feel the vibration through your seat. If you're getting bad vibes from your vehicle, bring it in and see if it's a balance issue or something else. You should balance your wheels whenever you get a new tire or remount a tire, like when it's been removed for a flat repair. Today, I want to talk about transfer case service. 
Now you may not know much about transfer cases, but if you have a four-wheel drive vehicle, you've got one. It makes sure you have power available for both the front and rear axles. For example, if you have a rear-wheel drive SUV, power goes to the rear wheels until you need four-wheel drive. That's when the transfer case steps in and transfers some of the power to the front wheels as well. You might use a shift lever to go into four-wheel drive, or it could be a button on the dash, or it might even go into four-wheel drive automatically, depending on your vehicle. The transfer case is serviced by periodically draining its fluid and replacing it with fresh fluid. We also check for leaks and damage. Transfer case fluid cools and lubricates the gears, chains, bearings, shafts, and other parts. Over time, the additives in the fluid wear out and it doesn't protect as well. Also, little bits of metal and clutch material wear off and contaminate the fluid. Look, there isn't a filter in the transfer case, so if the contamination is allowed to stay for too long, it'll further accelerate wear. Now, your owner's manual may not have a recommended interval for when you should change your transfer case fluid, so ask your service advisor. There are several things that affect how often you should change the fluid. So tell her how much you use four-wheel drive. If you drive in wet environments like crossing streams or through mud and snow, that kind of stuff really shortens the drain interval. Okay, transfer case parts will eventually wear out and you'll have to make repairs. But properly servicing your transfer case will keep that day as far in the future as possible. Let's review an important part of every vehicle, the transmission. Transmissions are heavy duty pieces of equipment that are designed to last a long time. But like any other machine, they'll eventually wear out and need repair. So let's focus on what you can do to push that day off as far as possible. The first thing you can do is to make sure your transmission always has enough fluid. Transmission fluid cools and lubricates the transmission. When there's not enough fluid, the transmission will run hotter and wear out sooner. The transmission fluid also provides the pressure needed to transfer power from the engine to the transmission. Not enough fluid and your transmission won't shift properly. Your service center will check your transmission fluid level with a full service oil change and top it off if needed. If you see any transmission fluid on the driveway, it's a reddish color, have us inspect it for a leak. A gasket, hose, or seal could be leaking and it may need to be repaired. The next thing you can do to prolong the life of your transmission is to replace your transmission fluid on schedule. As you can imagine, all those gears grinding on each other result in lots of little bits of metal in the fluid. The more there is, the faster the transmission parts will wear out. Transmission fluid also contains detergents and other additives to protect your transmission. These additives are depleted over time so old fluid doesn't protect as well as new fluid. Your owner's manual or service advisor will have a recommendation for when you should have your transmission serviced. If your transmission isn't shifting as smoothly as it should, or if you suspect a transmission leak, let us take a look at it and ask if it's time for a transmission service. Regular maintenance and taking care of small leaks right away will help your transmission last as long as possible. Let's talk about windshield wiper blades. Now, that may seem like a pretty mundane topic, but think about how important your vision is. We work hard to protect our eyes. If we need contacts or glasses, we take care of them too. Well, wiper blades are critical to our vision when we drive. That's right, Michelle. We really ought to think about wipers as part of an important safety system. We should think about maintaining safety, not just responding when our wiper blades fail. That's a good way of looking at it. I mean, how many times have you been caught off guard by the first storm of the season with a streaky windshield you can barely see out of? Yeah, or no washer fluid. Look, wiper blades live outside the vehicle, exposed to sun and heat in the summer. And cold and ice in the winter. It's no wonder that they get dry, brittle, and torn. I like to recommend changing wiper blades twice a year before they're so damaged that they don't work. If you replace them in one of your spring and fall oil changes, you should always have wiper blades that can get the job done. So what options are available for wiper blades? That's a good question. Some of us live in areas with more extreme weather and temperature conditions. You might just live somewhere where it rains more so your blades wear out faster, or you travel a lot and use your wipers to clean bugs and road grime. If that's the case, consider a premium grade wiper. There are special wiper material compounds, blade designs, and wiper arms that really improve your vision in adverse conditions. And I've seen special winter blades that don't get all clogged up with ice and snow. Yeah, there are blades for all sorts of conditions. We can also apply a special windshield treatment that repels rain, sleet, and snow as you drive. The increased visibility can improve your driving response time. 
Thanks, Jeremy. When it comes to wiper blades, it's important to think of it as maintaining the safety component by replacing your blades before they fail. That'll keep you seeing clearly in all conditions. Brittany, I want to talk about air conditioning, specifically about service and repair issues. Sure thing, Dave. Look, for most of us, we don't give our air conditioning a second thought, as long as it's making cold air, right? But it's a complex and expensive system that we should think about before it starts blowing hot air. Well, what do you mean? Well, for example, you may not know that the refrigerant and the air conditioner circulates a special oil that lubricates the AC parts. As refrigerant leaks out, the lubricant doesn't get moved through the system, and the compressor doesn't get enough oil to protect it, and it wears out faster than it should. And replacing a compressor is pretty expensive. So it's important to inspect the air conditioner for leaks as recommended and recharge the refrigerant as needed. Absolutely. And recharging the refrigerant has another benefit. The system tends to gather moisture and become corrosive. That causes leaks in the system, which can be expensive to repair. Recharging the AC system with refrigerant protects the air conditioning components and keeps the system operating at peak efficiency, so it doesn't have to work as hard to keep you cool. In fact, the number one cause of AC problems is not enough refrigerant. Okay, well that's really good to know. Now, even with regular service, AC parts can just wear out, can't they? Yes, normal wear and tear eventually gets to all moving parts. Addressing problems early can save on more extensive repairs down the road. Okay, so check your owner's manual or ask your service advisor for inspection recommendations. You got it. And if you're hearing strange sounds when your air conditioning turns on, or if it just isn't as cold as it used to be, have us give it a once over and see what it'll take to keep you cool. Now you've probably noticed a bunch of warning lights on your dash when you start your engine. They flash on to test the circuits and then go off if everything's okay. One of the warning lights looks like a car battery. Its job is to tell you if your battery is not charging properly. Now, you know that your battery stores electricity, enough to start your engine and get you moving, but that's about it. You can only get a few miles on battery power alone. You need an alternator to generate enough electricity to run your engine and power your electrical accessories like the stereo, power seats, heater fan, onboard computers, and so on. And on top of that, the alternator needs to recharge your battery. So when your alternator isn't working properly, there isn't enough electricity for all those things. When your alternator fails, you aren't going very far. So why would your alternator not work? Well, usually they've simply worn out. Alternators are driven by your serpentine belt and spin two to three times faster than the engine. That's a lot of work. The bearings wear out as do the copper wire coils and magnets that generate the electricity. There's no sense in hobbling along with an alternator that's not working properly. It will fail at some point and leave you stranded. Get a bad alternator replaced as soon as you can. Your service technician will test and install an alternator that meets your manufacturer's specifications. Some folks use a lot of additional electrical gizmos in the car like computers and DVD players or may regularly tow a camp trailer with a battery that recharges as you drive. If that sounds like you, talk with your service advisor about upgrading to a more heavy-duty alternator to meet your needs. Your axles are the last link in transferring power from the engine to your wheels. They're strong parts that last a long time, but they can run into trouble. Of course, axles just wear out over time and need to be replaced, and sometimes axle seals leak, causing the axle to wear out prematurely. Lubricant leaks out, and water and dirt can get in and contaminate the gears. When this happens, you might hear strange noises coming from your axle. If you have a rear-wheel drive vehicle, the sound would be at the back. If you have a front-wheel drive vehicle, the sound would be up front. Of course, with an all-wheel drive vehicle, the sound could come from either the front or the back. It might be a groaning sound or a clunking noise when you're turning. Your service technician can inspect for leaking seals. There's a rubber boot that protects the constant velocity, or CV, joints on some axles. If the rubber is torn, the axle can become contaminated. An inspection can reveal if the boot is getting near failure. The axle shaft will be removed and inspected. If it's damaged, the shaft will have to be replaced. If the shaft is in good shape, it'll be cleaned, lubed, and reinstalled and damaged CV boots are replaced as well. Now it's important to take care of this work as soon as you become aware of the problem. Waiting only makes the damage worse and more expensive to repair later. If the axle fails completely, it could lock up, and this could severely damage other things, like your transmission, which is very expensive. 
It could also contribute to an accident, which nobody wants. So taking care of your axles when they need it saves money in the long run and helps keep you safely on the road. Batteries are a huge part of modern life. I mean, how many battery chargers do you have around? I've got a box full of them. Of course, we're here to talk about your car battery. When people come into my center and need a new battery, they're really not that happy about having to spend the money. But the fact is that 70% of batteries don't last four years. But there's some things you can do to extend the life of your battery. First, keep it clean. If you see it getting dirty or greasy, let us know and we can clean it off. A dirty battery runs hotter and that shortens its life. If your battery terminals are corroded, let us take a look at that too. We can clean them up and if the corrosion has gotten into the battery cables, we can replace them. Also, running your battery way down is bad for it. Things like running the headlights or watching a DVD player with the car turned off can deeply deplete your battery. The typical battery can only take about 10 of these deep cycle depletions before it gives up the ghost. Now because we often take short trips around town with lots of stops for errands, our batteries can end up not getting fully recharged just by driving around. That also shortens battery life. But you can hook up a good quality automatic battery charger at home from time to time. I recommend charging once a month during hot months and every three months during cold months. Now when it's finally time to get a new battery, we can help you find the right replacement. We'll always make sure to meet your manufacturer's recommendations. Now if you have some special needs, like you live in a very cold climate or run a lot of electrical accessories, we can look at an upgrade that'll give you all the power you need. You know, when my check engine light comes on, I'm torn between utter panic and just wanting to ignore it and hope it goes away. Yeah, well that's understandable because that same check engine light could be coming on for anything from serious damage to your transmission to all the way down to just a loose gas cap. A loose gas cap? There's a trouble code for that, seriously? Well, that's a really good question. See, there's a very common misconception that the trouble code stored in your engine computer when your check engine light comes on will specifically identify a problem. It's really more like pointing to the symptoms of a problem. Take uh, your temperature, for instance. Say it's 101. Your heat sensor, the thermometer, tells you that your temperature is out of the normal range, but what it doesn't tell you is why you have a fever. Right. Is it the flu or a sinus infection? You need more information, more tests. Exactly. And for any given trouble code, there could be a number of causes. So your trained technician takes the trouble code as a starting point and begins a diagnostic process to determine the cause of the problem. And for some problems, it takes longer than others. So when your engine management system logs a problem and illuminates the check engine light, you plug in a scanner, download the trouble codes, and go to work tracing the cause of the problem, right? Yep, that's when our training, equipment, databases, and skill get put to work diagnosing the problem and fixing it. Oh, and Dave, if your check engine light is flashing, it means that the problem could lead to serious damage and you should get to the service center as soon as possible to get the problem solved. If it's on but not flashing, you have some time to get in at your convenience. All right, thanks, Brittany. I feel better already. Hey, you don't need me to tell you how important your brakes are. Having good brakes just keeps you out of trouble, so carefully maintaining your brakes is the key. With disc brakes, brake pads rub on a disc or rotor to slow the wheels. The pads are attached to a caliper that squeezes them against the rotor. It's kind of like how squeezing the handbrake on a bicycle pushes the brake pads against the wheel of the bike. Now pads just wear away with use, kind of like how a pencil eraser wears out. But the good news is that replacing brake pads is a straightforward repair. If you hear squealing or grinding when you use the brakes, have your service advisor check them out. He'll have a technician perform a thorough brake inspection to see what needs to be done. He'll check for signs of brake problems and go over other brake components to see that they're working properly. And he can tell you if it's time to replace the pads or if there are other issues with your brakes that should be addressed. Some people ignore the warning signs and keep driving long after the pads are completely worn out. But when that happens, metal brake components will grind on the rotor, damaging it enough that it needs to be resurfaced or replaced. The rotors can also warp or crack, in which case they'll need to be replaced. Brake calipers also wear out over time. They can develop leaks or the caliper pistons can freeze open or closed, either way, it's not good. And when this happens, it's time to replace the calipers. A thorough brake inspection will reveal worn bearings or seals as well. The new pads we put on your vehicle will restore your brakes to manufacturer specifications. 
or we can install upgraded parts to increase your power to stop and reduce brake noise and brake dust. We have several options to meet your braking requirements and your budget. So taking care of your brakes keeps them working safely and you could prevent premature brake repairs down the road. Brakes that work properly are essential to your safety. So of course, you want to carefully maintain your brakes. In vehicles equipped with drum brakes, the brake components are housed inside a drum that rotates with the wheel. When you step on the brake pedal, brake shoes push out against the inside of the drum, slowing the wheel. Now, brake shoes just wear away by rubbing on the drum when you brake. When it's time to replace brake shoes, it's a straightforward repair. If you hear squealing or grinding when braking, have your service advisor check them out. He'll have a service technician perform a thorough brake inspection to see what needs to be done. He'll check for signs of brake problems and go over other brake components to see that they're working properly. He can tell you if it's time to replace the shoes or if there's other brake issues that should be addressed. Now, some people ignore the warning signs and keep driving long after the shoes are completely worn out. When that happens, metal brake components will grind against the drum, damaging it enough that it has to be resurfaced or replaced. When you push on your brake pedal, the wheel cylinder is activated and it pushes the shoes against the drum to slow the vehicle. This cylinder and various springs within the brake can wear out affecting your ability to stop. But the worn components can easily be replaced. The new shoes we put on will restore your brakes to manufacturer specifications. Or we can install upgraded parts to increase your stopping power and reduce brake noise and brake dust. We have several options to meet your braking requirements and your budget. So, taking care of your brakes keeps them working safely and you could prevent premature brake repairs down the road. We'd like to talk about your vehicle's evaporative emissions control system, or EVAP for short. Your vehicle's fuel system is sealed to trap vapors before they can escape into the atmosphere. The EVAP system draws in fresh air, gathers up vaporized hydrocarbons, and delivers them to the intake system to be burned in the engine. If there's a leak or blockage in the EVAP system, a trouble code will be generated setting off the check engine light. There are many EVAP system components that could have problems. Things as simple as a worn or loose gas cap or a rusty fuel filler pipe. How about the fuel tank, purge valve, canister vent valve, charcoal canister, and the canister filter? Then there's the fuel tank pressure sensor, the fuel level sensor, electronic control module, vapor lines, and the vapor switching valve. With a list like that, it takes some skill and some specialized equipment to properly diagnose an EVAP system problem. Your qualified service center will take a reading and perform a function test on the various valves. If necessary, a low pressure smoke test will be performed to visually spot any leaks. Again, proper equipment is required so that the tests don't cause further damage. EVAP system problems don't usually hurt performance or cause damage, however, there are very good reasons for making the repairs. First, you only have one check engine light, but there are hundreds of problems that can trigger it. When you don't fix an EVAP problem, the check engine light will stay on, masking other problems that might occur. Of course, if local regulations require passing an emissions test, your vehicle will fail. Finally, harmful emissions are being released into the atmosphere. Now, if you have an illuminated check engine light, get in and have your vehicle diagnosed. You'll want the peace of mind. Okay, we've all heard a car or truck thunder by that needs a new muffler, but there's actually more to the exhaust system than just the muffler. Yep, the exhaust system has three main functions. First, it safely gets the hot exhaust gas from the engine out to the tailpipe. Second, it treats the exhaust to remove harmful pollutants. And third, it muffles the engine noise. Okay, now you said it safely moves the exhaust. What do you mean by that? That's a good question. Exhaust gas is poisonous. You don't want it getting into the passenger compartment where we sit. Carbon monoxide can be deadly. That's why you should never run your engine in a closed garage. So if you have a leak somewhere in the exhaust system, it could get into the passenger cabin and make you sick or even kill you. Yeah, it's pretty serious. And if you smell exhaust in the vehicle, roll down your windows and get it inspected. You may smell or see exhaust coming from the engine compartment or under the vehicle if you have a leak. Now, I imagine you could hear a leak too. Sometimes it's loud and obvious, and sometimes it's just a ticking sound when you start the engine that goes away as you drive. 
That could be a small crack or a bad fitting that leaks when it's cold, but seals up when the metal heats and expands. Wow, sounds like you can't underestimate the safety aspects of an exhaust leak. No, you really can't. Okay, now I can address the environmental issues. Exhaust gas contains a number of pollutants and particulates. The catalytic converter scrubs some of those harmful substances, and diesel vehicles have systems to deal with soot. But catalytic converters eventually wear out and need to be replaced. They're expensive, so you want to help them last as long as possible by keeping the fuel system clean and replacing your air filter. That's exactly right. These components need to be tested for function with an emissions test from time to time. And that leaves the muffler. It's my favorite part. Thought it would be. Well, that's the beauty of it. You get a muffler that suits your taste. Some want whisper quiet, others like a little rumble. And some like a roar. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. As vehicle manufacturers are required to improve corporate average fuel economy, they are looking to a host of technologies to meet government mandated targets and make enough power. One of those technologies is forced air induction. In familiar terms, this means using turbochargers and superchargers to force more air into the engine. More air means more power from a relatively small engine, which delivers good fuel economy. That's why you're seeing more and more turbo and supercharged engines available. Turbochargers use exhaust from the engine to spin an impeller that compresses the air sent to the engine. Superchargers are driven by a belt connected to the engine's crankshaft. Chargers that are powered by an electric motor are on the horizon. These turbos and superchargers spin at very high RPMs. The bearings require a steady supply of clean oil for lubrication and protection. A bit of oil sludge blocking that passage could burn out the bearings. The best thing you can do for your turbocharger or supercharger is to change your oil on schedule. In addition to strictly following the oil change schedule, you should always use a high quality oil of the type recommended by the manufacturer. Use the correct weight, and if the owner's manual says to use synthetic oil, use synthetic oil. And with a turbo or supercharged engine, your air induction system will have a lot of air passing through it. Have an air induction cleaning service performed as recommended. And remember to change your air filter when needed. Another important factor is the proper grade of fuel. These engines experience extra pressure in the engine as the fuel and air is compressed. Using fuel with too low of an octane rating could cause premature detonation, which can lead to expensive damage. Servicing turbos and supercharged engines requires a well-qualified shop. We are honored to help you take care of your family's vehicles. Your fuel pump sends fuel from your fuel tank to your engine. Sometimes fuel pumps fail, usually with little or no warning, and they need to be replaced. Now, the majority of fuel pumps are inside the fuel tank, so getting to them can be a big deal. In some vehicles, the fuel tank must be removed to access the pump. Depending on the design of the vehicle and the condition of the fuel tank, it may need to be replaced along with the pump. And as you can imagine, that is pretty labor intensive. It's also dangerous because the flammable fuel must be properly handled. So don't try this at home. That is so true. Now, there are some best practices your service technician follows that you should know about. First, it's recommended that the entire fuel pump assembly, including the electrical relay, be replaced. When one component has failed, another one is probably close to failure. With all of the labor involved, replacing the entire assembly is a long-term cost saver. Another best practice is to always use a quality replacement pump that matches your original equipment specifications. So-called universal replacement pumps may spin at a different speed than the engine management computer is calibrated for. The mismatch could cause performance and longevity issues. Now, there are some things you can do to help your fuel pump last longer. First, don't let your fuel tank run too low. When fuel is low, the pump has to work very hard to suck up enough fuel from the bottom. Also, the pump is submerged in fuel which cools and lubricates it. Refueling at a quarter tank or so will extend fuel pump life. Also, E85 gasoline can damage your fuel pump if you do not have a flex fuel vehicle. The high level of ethanol can damage seals in your fuel system, creating a fire hazard. Your service facility has the expertise and equipment to safely replace your fuel pump with the right part.
Okay, Brittany, I just read that 40% of traffic fatalities take place at night, even though there's 60% less traffic. Wow, that just goes to show how important proper visibility is to nighttime driving. Obviously, a clean windshield is important, and so are good wiper blades. But what role do your headlights play? Oh, a big role. There are two main concerns. One is with the headlamp or bulb. The other is with the lens. The fact of the matter is, headlamps go dim over time. You just need to replace them. Some vehicles come with a standard bulb, which you can replace, or you can upgrade to a halogen bulb that is much brighter. Halogen costs a little bit more, but you'd be amazed at the difference. I've heard it's a good idea to replace your headlamps once a year. The idea is that your lamps never dim to the point that they become a safety issue. Right, many experts recommend that. Now the other issue is a headlamp lens. For the last couple of decades, most lenses are made of plastic, which can get cloudy or yellow, and that blocks a lot of lights. Yeah, I've seen that. Do you have to replace the lens? Well, problem is each lens assembly can cost as much as $350 to $400. It's much less expensive to restore the lens if it isn't broken. We use a process of special cleaners and polishes to remove the yellowed and hazy layer of the lens. We then apply a hard protective finish. When we're done, your lenses really are as good as new. And I assume it costs quite a bit less to restore a lens than to replace it. It really does. The price depends on the size of the lens and how yellowed or cloudy it is. And you can even restore taillights and turn signals. So combining a headlamp restoration with new bulbs will light up the road like a new car. You might say, I can clearly see the advantage. <laughs> you know, computers control a very large percentage of engine functions. One very important function is how much fuel is delivered to the engine. That's right. The computer calculates the amount of fuel that's needed and when to deliver it. An important part of that calculation is the proper air and fuel mixture. That's based on the volume, temperature, and density of the air. The mass airflow sensor measures all of those things and reports them to the computer, which makes adjustments to keep your engine performing efficiently. So, outside air enters the air intake system, passes through the engine air filter, and then passes through the mass airflow sensor, and then into the engine. Now, when your air filter is dirty, dust and other contaminants get through and end up on the mass airflow sensor. Now the resulting problem is that the sensor can become contaminated, affecting its measurements. The computer is sending out instructions based on false readings which can affect drivability, your catalytic converter, exhaust emissions, trigger a check engine light, even prevent your engine from running. So we're back to the engine air filter. It's truly the first line of defense against some pretty expensive problems. Should your mass airflow sensor become contaminated, it may be possible to clean it during an air induction cleaning service. If the sensor has been damaged, it needs to be replaced. Another air filter issue has to do with the quality of the filter itself. Filter material from low line filters can actually break loose and contaminate the mass airflow sensor. Of course, your service center always uses quality replacement filters. Okay, let's talk shocks and struts. I'm Summer, here with Jeremy. Now, shock absorbers last a long time and wear out pretty slowly, so I guess you could say they're easy to take for granted. Definitely, but your shocks and struts, they do a very important job, so you need to pay attention to them. They keep your tires on the road, and your tires are what connect your vehicle to the road and allow you to safely handle your car through turns, over bumps, and even stop in time. Yeah, definitely important. So what happens when your shocks or struts are worn? Excellent question. When your shocks and struts are worn, your tires, they bounce successively over bumps. Your vehicle will wallow through corners. Your front end will dive when you stop, and your rear end will squat when you accelerate. All this hurts your ability to control your vehicle, and your ride just isn't as comfortable. Okay, so bad handling and control. I've also heard that worn shocks or struts cause excessive tire wear, so you'll have to replace your tires sooner than you should. That's very true. It also stresses other suspension and steering parts, causing them to wear prematurely. Struts are actually a major structural component of the suspension system. There's a lot riding on them. Replacing shocks and struts saves money in the long run. And of course, you can't really put a price on your safety and the safety of your passengers. We generally recommend replacing shocks and struts at 50,000 miles. Okay, so say I need new shocks or struts. What now? Well, we've got you covered. We can give you back the ride and handling of a new vehicle. 
If you have special needs, we can help you there too. We have premium shocks and struts that'll improve your performance. We can even help you with upgraded heavy duty shocks that'll give you the confidence you need to handle the big towing and hauling jobs. So do you just replace shocks one at a time or how does that work? Excellent question. Experts recommend replacing all four shocks at the same time so that handling is even at each wheel. Makes sense. And so if you need new shocks or struts, let us help you take care of this important safety service. You'll feel better. You'll save money on tires and other suspension repairs down the road. Today's vehicles are safer than they've ever been. Their design and construction provide tremendous protection in an accident. And your airbags can be a real lifesaver. That's right, your airbags are part of a very sophisticated system of sensors and computers called the Supplemental Restraint System, or SRS. These sensors are all over your vehicle, detecting things like where passengers are sitting, how much they weigh, as well as the speed and direction of an impact during a crash. All of this information is fed into the SRS computer that determines if and when an airbag or airbag should be deployed. You know, an airbag has to be inflated very quickly in order to protect vehicle occupants. The inflation is basically the result of a controlled explosion, a violent event in itself. That's why the SRS computer will only deploy an airbag in life-threatening circumstances where an airbag will actually be of help. That's right. Deploying an airbag in the wrong circumstances could do more harm than good. Hard, direct side and front impacts, and also rollovers, are more likely to trigger airbags. Now, there are a few things to keep in mind about airbags. First, if the SRS dash light stays on, you need to have your system checked. Something's wrong. Now, when the driver's side steering wheel airbag is deployed, the steering wheel clock spring is damaged. So the spring should be replaced when the new airbag is installed. Also, when an airbag deploys, some or all of the sensors we've been talking about may be pre-triggered, meaning they're ready to go off. Simply hitting a pothole could set off an airbag. So always have all SRS sensors replaced when replacing a deployed airbag. Only new airbags should be installed. No one can guarantee the condition of a salvaged airbag. Only a qualified facility should work on your SRS system. And always remember that small children and child safety seats are safer in rear seats. Let's talk about your suspension. You know, the system that connects your wheels to the vehicle, controls your handling, and delivers a good ride. Your suspension is critical for proper steering, stopping, and stability. Hey, it's a rough world out there, and every time you hit a pothole, a bump, or a, an object in the road, your suspension system has to absorb that impact and maintain control. As you can imagine, your suspension has a lot of joints and pivot points that allow your wheels to move up and down over bumps and to turn as you steer. Now these joints simply wear out over time. When a joint is worn, the suspension parts don't fit together as tightly as they should. Handling and steering has a loose feel, and you may hear strange noises. Your tires will wear unevenly because they're bouncing down the road a little off kilter. A loose joint has the effect of stressing other suspension components, so they wear out faster than they should. And sometimes a suspension part can be bent from hitting a rock or curb or by slamming into a pothole. So when your technician inspects your vehicle, he'll look for signs of suspension problems. Things like uneven tire wear, excessive play in suspension components, and other visible damage. He can replace the worn or damaged parts and restore safe handling. It's a great idea to take care of these problems right away before they become more expensive to repair. And nobody likes to see a tire that should last for several years get worn out in a matter of months because of a bad suspension part. So let us help you keep your vehicle operating safely. And saving some money on repairs and tire replacement is a good thing too. All new cars and light trucks since 2008 have come equipped with a tire pressure monitoring system. The TPMS system detects when a tire becomes underinflated and lights up a warning light on the dash. So what's the big deal? Well, underinflated tires can be a real safety concern. First of all, they don't handle properly and that can lead to an accident. And second, underinflated tires can overheat and cause the tire to come apart, which can also lead to an accident. That's right, Jeremy. Government regulations requiring TPMS systems aim to reduce accidents and save lives, a very worthy goal. There are also positive environmental effects because underinflated tires are fuel wasters. You lose 1% of your fuel economy for every three pounds of pressure below ideal. So proper tire inflation can save you a tank of gas a year. And your tires last longer, so you won't have to replace them as often. 
There are two kinds of TPMS systems. Direct systems have a battery-powered sensor in each wheel that measures tire pressure. The sensor sends a signal to a receiver that illuminates the warning light if pressure is low on a tire. Indirect systems use a computer program to detect underinflation by measuring wheel rotation speeds and other data. You'll have to replace TPMS parts as they wear out. Obviously, the batteries in the sensors will die someday. Road, salt, and grime can damage sensors too. The system needs to be reset when you rotate or change your tires. Because the TPMS system is so important to your safety, you should make the necessary repairs when needed. And remember, TPMS is no substitute for regularly checking your tire pressure at least once a month. Okay, water pumps. We don't think about them often, but they're a really important part of our vehicles. Yep, so let's take a step back. You see, the engine is cooled by, by coolant antifreeze mixed with water. This mixture circulates around that engine, absorbing some of the heat. The coolant then flows through the radiator where air cools it down for the return trip back through the engine. And the water pump is what drives this process. Now I've heard that cooling system problems are the number one mechanical failure. So the water pump plays a pretty important role. Absolutely right. You can't get very far without a water pump. So do water pumps just wear out? I mean, what causes them to fail? Well, after all those miles and years of pumping coolant, they just wear out. You might notice a whining or grinding sound coming from the water pump, or maybe you'll see coolant leaking from the pump itself. So where is the water pump located? Well, the exact location varies depending on the vehicle. Some have the water pump attached to the outside of the engine where you can see it. With those, the water pump is driven by the serpentine belt. Some have the water pump driven by the timing belt. The timing belt cover often hides the water pump with this setup, so you can't see the pump without removing the cover. Oh great, a little more complicated. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a do-it-yourself project. No, it really isn't. When you have your technician replace your water pump on one of these, you really should replace the timing belt at the same time. You see, we've already gotten things taken apart and the belt's likely been contaminated by coolant. The timing belts usually need to be replaced every 60 to 90,000 miles anyway, so it just makes sense to do both jobs at once. And the opposite is probably true too. When you change the timing belt on this type of engine, replace the water pump while you're at it. Exactly right. The water pump will eventually fail, and getting to it is an expensive project. So for a little more, you can take care of both the timing belt and the water pump at the same time. Good stuff. Thanks, Jeremy. For a lot of people, their wheel bearings are something they've never even considered. Wheel bearings are what enable your wheels to spin freely. Since they bear the entire weight of the vehicle, they have to be tough. Wheel bearings can last well over 100,000 miles, but they do wear out and eventually need to be replaced. You might hear a groaning sound from your wheels. The sound might disappear at some speeds and reappear at others. Your service technician can quickly tell if your bearings are bad by raising the vehicle and wiggling the wheel. When you grasp the top and the bottom of the tire, it shouldn't move along the vertical axis. Many vehicles these days have wheel bearing assemblies that cannot be serviced. When those bearings go bad, we simply replace the entire assembly. For those vehicles with wheel bearings that can be accessed, we can do some preventive maintenance. You may have heard the phrase, pack the bearings. Well, with this procedure, we remove the bearings, carefully clean them, and inspect for any imperfection or wear. If the bearings can be reused, we reinstall them and pack them with grease. If not, we put in new bearings. Check your owner's manual or ask your service advisor if your bearings can be serviced. And if so, when should it be done? Now, taking care of bad bearings is extremely important. When bearings go bad, they generate tremendous amounts of heat, enough to lock up the wheel. That's not a good thing at any speed. In some cases, the wheel can even fall off. Either of these could cause a serious accident. So have your wheel bearings inspected if you think there's a problem and replace them right away if there is one.